Have you ever wondered how your sales performance compares against your competitors and peers? The B2B Sales Benchmark Report provides the definitive guide to what success looks like in 2021. See how you compare in terms of win rate, sales cycle, average deal value, relationships, and engagement. You can see the results and get the full report at ebster.com forward slash B2B dash sales dash benchmarks. This is Sales Ops Demystified, the number one most downloaded podcast in sales operations. We invite the brightest minds in sales operations onto the show to deconstruct the why, what, and how behind rep productivity, forecasting, metrics, and all things revenue. This podcast is brought to you by Ebster, the leading customer engagement platform for Salesforce. to another very special episode of Sales Ops Demystified. We're joined by Tyler Holmes of Beamery. I think this is going to be a super interesting chat because Tyler actually comes from the life side of <laughs> revenue operations. <laughs> I'm going to say that, obviously. Tyler has an extensive background in marketing, but has shifted over and now is running sales operations at Beamery. Tyler, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to kick off by understanding how you got into sales operations, because I can see in your work history that as a previous director of marketing, you were responsible um, for sales ops. Is that how you got into it? or uh, I have a fairly interesting journey just uh, in general to where I am now. Um, so my degree is actually in microbiology, and I started out as pre-med. Um, and life, as it seems to do, kind of intervened. Um, and I, I ended up actually in my second passion, which was teaching. Um, so I taught, seems like a lifetime ago, a, a, a middle school and high school science uh, physics to AP bio for, for about five years. Um, so basically, I spent those five years learning how to teach teenagers so I could figure out how to teach salespeople now. And teaching <laughs> salespeople is way easier than teaching teenagers. Um, I, I, it's, yeah. So if I'm ever having a bad day, I just remember back to trying to teach, you know, a 13 year old about mitochondria or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, uh, the way that I sort of started making this foray into where I am now um, was uh, my wife has been in marketing for years. Um, we wanted to make a move to Portland, Oregon. Uh, I was looking for a job and uh, that this was at a time where teaching jobs were hard to come by. And I ended up actually um, getting a job at a creative agency in Portland um, doing support and training for marketing automation uh, tools. So uh, this was at a time where, believe it or not, some of this stuff was, was fairly new. Um, we had about 200 clients across three or four different ESPs, um, one of which was Exact Target, which now is known as Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Um, so they kind of took a flyer on me. Uh, there was a lot of me listening in meetings and me just writing down a bunch of words that I had never heard of, uh, and then mm -hmm. frantically Googling them, um, and trying to figure out what, it, what the heck I was doing. Um, so I sold, implemented, supported, uh, and optimized email for some fairly large brands. Um, so I'm self-taught in everything I do. So, um, one of the things that I started seeing was that a lot of my clients had no idea how their email was working for them aside from, you know, they had a 15% open rate and a few people clicked on the email. So um, I taught myself a lot of what I call performance marketing skills. So the sort of alphabet soup that sales and marketing likes to make, you know, GA, GTM, PPC, SEO, mm -hmm. CTO, you know, SQL, whatever you want to talk about. Right. Um, so I started building out this department of one, 
um, and, and the clients that I was working with, I was just kind of offering help uh, in various areas. Um, so one of the things that I taught myself early on was Google Analytics. Um, we were an omni-channel agency. We had a, a pretty large focus on email, um, but I ended up doing a lot of custom analytics implementations for web and mobile, <clears throat> excuse me, um, providing ROI assessments for the campaigns that we were doing, um, which at the time was fairly, I hate to use this word, but like fairly progressive. Like there wasn't a lot of that happening. Um, so, and as well as just doing some more complicated implementations of exact target. So um, we start off pretty small um, and I was there for about five years. I left as a director there um, and went from, you know, kind of doing this ad hoc and, and kind of just throwing my services out there for free um, to working on dashboards for Nike and, um, working for Taco Bell on uh, at the time was the second mobile ordering app in the world um, behind Starbucks. So um, made some pretty big strides. Uh, I had a larger team. It wasn't just me doing this. Um, so that was kind of how I started this journey. Um, but we were, we were about 95% B2C there. And the small amount of B2B work uh, that we did there, I really, I really liked. Um, much more process, people focused. Um, so I got the opportunity to be a marketing services director at a Salesforce shop called Blue Wolf. Um, I was brought on primarily to handle uh, Salesforce Marketing Cloud, uh, but ended up getting certified in Marketo, Pardot, Eloqua, host of other sort of marketing specific tools that plug into Salesforce. Um, we were doing really, really large implementations of marketing automation um, and then also working cross-functionally with sales and service. Um, so I got certified in, in that side of the house as well. Um, so we were doing work with T-Mobile and GE and a bunch of other ones that were you know, fairly large. I was writing the strategy, scoping the deals and, and running the team, which was really awesome and a, and a great le learning experience. Um, but I was doing a lot of travel and I had my first little girl and travel was not something I wanted to do anymore, um, or at least not as much as I was doing. Uh, and I figured it was kind of time for me to put my money where my mouth was uh, and actually run a brand for the first time. So I made my first move to my first brand, which is a company called Newton Software uh, in the HR tech space. Uh, I was brought on initially to build the ground up marketing capabilities, but ended up running both marketing and sales operations because there wasn't anybody there to do it. So I ran top of funnel to close, um, had about a $3 million advertising budget and a full stack sales org with AEs, SDRs, all of the host of technology that goes with kind of optimizing that. So fast forward today, I'm at Beamery. Um, another HR tech SaaS company. Um, actually, uh, the person who brought me on was the co-owner and co-founder of Newton Software, uh, Joel Passan. So he's kind of brought the band back together and, and bringing me on to build out the, the GTM capabilities from the ground up at Beamery. Um, so this is, will be the, actually the, the first time that I'm solely focused on sales uh, and don't have marketing under my wing. But I've got service and seller training and enablement, and we're doing really well uh recently named in a short list of companies most likely to hit a billion so uh nice. that's great yeah um, so zooming in onto the the sales organization at beamery approximately how many are reps and how many people <coughs> in operations um we're a little under 20 at the moment um between sdrs aes we're starting to bring on sales engineers and so the team is rapidly growing and then in, in operations as well uh, operations, it is a team of one. Fantastic, that's how I like it. So you're currently responsible for everything that these guys are currently doing. Yeah, it's about a 70 person org um, that I'm, yeah. I have, I have uh, uh, some help with uh, from an agency um, about uh, half time. So yeah, um, I'm doing a lot. I'm being the admin, I'm uh, doing the strategy and learning a ton, it's fun. Nice. Yeah. Um, can we zoom in on the current uh, sales tech stack you guys are currently running? Yeah. Um, you know, we've got, got a, I mean, we have a pretty 
a uh, pretty good stack. Uh, so I, I mentioned Salesforce. Uh, we're using Marketo for marketing automation. Um, we've got uh, Visible for attribution um, and lean data. We use lean data for routing and object automation. Um, I'm using, which is something I've never used before, which was cool, or at least their services in this way, which um, we're using G2 Crowd for some buyer intent stuff. Uh, we've got a direct mail platform. Um, we just recently switched from sales loft to Mixmax for velocity and uh, a couple other you, uh, smaller tools. What's that? Out of, interest, out of interest, why did you switch from sales loft to Mixmax? Um, I mean, we're not a high velocity shop, so we're not you know, sending thousands of emails a day. So a lot of the capabilities that sales loft had, we weren't really leveraging and um, I, I inherited a uh, implementation that was had some problems. Um, so uh, Mixmax offered a lot more functionality, a lot easier onboarding and, and just usage in general. Um, and we've been super happy. Um, it's really user friendly and um, it's really made us a lot more efficient. Um. I'm assuming that you're responsible for data quality for this, this 70 person org. Um, how they're going and what are the what are the processes in place that you use them to try and manage uh, this potential challenge? Yeah, Tata, that's I mean that's that's always I mean that that, that never ends. Um, even when you think you have it, it's, it just seems like it crops up. I think Salesforce like injects things in there just to keep you on your toes. Um, so yeah, I mean, like you said, ultimately I'm kind of responsible for everything that go goes in there. Um, and, and we work in the HR space, which is really not very well covered by a lot of the common data enrichment tools. Um, and our ICP that we sell to is, is fairly niche. Um, so I do a fair amount of manual data enrichment via Upworkers or other kind of scrappy methods. My performance marketing stuff has actually come in handy here as they're there's some fair amount of tools that are not really designed for what I'm using them for, um, but I've uh, been able to kind of leverage for at scale data enrichment at Beamery. So um, I'm really strict about what can go into Salesforce and who can actually create stuff. Um, we've done um, a pretty good job of getting our total addressable market into Salesforce as we, we know it. So we don't actually add a lot of companies um, and there's, so there's not really that much of a problem with duplicates. Um, we use uh, Cloudingo for ones that in inevitably do arise. But um, right now, the most of my time, as far as data goes, is spent uh, figuring out how to enrich our data with stuff that helps us prioritize a little bit better. Um, and none of that comes out of like a tidy box like Zoom or Discover Org. That's all sort of, uh, you know, all hands on deck manual work or, or leveraging some teams of upworkers or various ways of doing that. And actually the fact that um, your ICP is not covered by those big data providers is also potentially a good thing as well because you're having to work harder to get that data, which means that in theory, those people are not getting as much outreach done to them. Would, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, for 2020, I mean, one of my goals is, is to probably bring on someone. I mean, even if it's if it's not one of the, the bigger tools, I mean, we, we do obviously need to find people in general. I mean, we leverage Sales Navigator, but, um, you know, getting people's contact information and things like that, that's always a challenge for people. Um, so it, it hasn't hampered us yet. But, um, you know, we, we don't have, uh, like I said, the, the data that I can pull aside from contacts out of those tools is just, it's not helpful for us. Yeah, got it. Um, let's talk about your relationship with the, the sales team. I know you have experience teaching people. Um, how do you think that experience helps you engaging with your reps at the moment? Yeah, we've got a... Um, we have a, uh, on one hand, a, a very seasoned group of sales folks. We, we made the commitment to, to hire people who have been doing this job for a while and, and more specifically doing this job selling HR tech. Um, it's a, it's a very interesting market to sell to. It's a very, you know, specific kind of buyer persona. And so people who have done it before and kind of have a leg up, um, as well as just kind of knowing the space and knowing the players. Um, it's, it's a fairly well, uh, it's a, it's a tight knit group. Um, so 
Um, on the one hand, I've got these very seasoned sellers. On the other hand, I've got a group of SDRs that are, you know, young and, and, and very good at what they're doing and hungry to do things. So trying to teach like, you know, one, both sides of the, of the game is, has been interesting. I mean, and, and even with some of these seasoned sellers, you'd be surprised at what they, you know, sometimes it's teaching a whole dog new tricks. Um, so I, um, I, I end up, I do office hours twice a week. Um, I'm very open with the team about taking recommendations and I'm really responsive to change. Um, we can be really nimble as a company right now. So, um, and coming from marketing, I'm really comfortable being a production cowboy, as I call it. Um, we, we've got a release process for larger things, but um, I never had a sandbox for the first three quarters of my career. So to be able to kind of make helpful quick changes that comes from the team allows me to kind of score some points with the team. Um, and so they know I'm listening and I'm frequently reminding them that I work for them, not the other way around. Um, so that that's kind of the relationship that I have with them. It sounds like a very healthy way to approach it. And I like the concept of being a production cowboy. <laughs> yeah. It, because... kind of freaks, it kind of freaks people out, but I mean, coming mm -hmm. from marketing, you know, like the concept of a sandbox was not, that wasn't really a thing. Um, well, the, the ones that did have sandboxes, you would build it and then they had no way of getting it into production. So you would end up building it again. So not only did you build it once without a mistake, now you have to build it a second time without a mistake. Uh, so it, it was just kind of faster to just be, you know, measure twice at once. Got it. Um, any tips on onboarding sales reps? I assume you guys have probably done hiring in the past year. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're young. Uh, we don't have a lot of specialized roles. We don't have a lot of hierarchy um, that a lot of, you know, kind of more long in the tooth companies have. Um, so we don't, we're hiring for it, but, you know, we don't have a role like sales enablement. So I'm, like I said, I'm in charge of training and, and enablement. So I, I built out that onboarding and training program, um, you know, getting people demo certified, teaching them Salesforce processes. Um, you know, like I said, we, we committed to hiring these experienced sellers. Um, but I, you know, I'm doing everything from teaching somebody what a lead and a contact is because they had a proprietary CRM that they used wherever they were at prior. And, and, you know, this is a new thing to them. Um, it's, it's a fairly labor intensive hands-on approach. And we start before, uh, their, their shadow graces our, our, our door basically. Um, so we, we talk regularly, we, we meet regularly, um, I help price and work their first few deals along with um, my VP. Um, I make a lot of like quick process videos. So as I'm building, I try and remember to actually, you know, video myself talking. Um, unfortunately, I have to talk usually. Uh, so and and I work we, we work really hard at, at automating as many things as, as we can for them. So I want them selling, uh, not entering information into Salesforce. So we, we brought them to for their expertise there, not for their expertise in, in you know, data enrichment. Totally agree. And my next question was actually about productivity. Yeah. Can you name like something that you managed to automate that saved like significant time from a, a rest day? Uh, yeah, I mean, we do, we do a lot of that. I mean, one of the things is just, you know, enriching their accounts for them with data that's manually you have to go manually do. So one of the things that we really care about is uh, what ATS a company is using. So that's not something that I can just go pull out of a tool. Although I have found a couple ways of, of automating some of that, but I, you know, we went, we went out, we made a few videos on how to find the ATS. And then I farmed it out to a bunch of Upworkers and brought it back in, did some testing, brought it back into the org. And it's been, you know, we haven't had many complaints about the, the data quality there. Um, so that's something that saves them significant time because that's something that they have to know um, before they even try and reach out to someone. And I bet yeah, you implemented that since you joined, right? I'm sorry, what? Uh, you, you implemented that process of getting the ATS info Awesome yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. I mean, there was a number of those things, like I said, our, our, our market is kind of niche. So, you know, there's a number of things that we had to, you know, I, I needed to go out and get to in order to understand what our addressable market was. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, understanding how large their recruiting team was and, and various other sort of things that go into us prioritizing one account over the other. I bet the reps really liked you after you did that for them. 
It was very helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's that's the the fun part of my job. I think is is dreaming up ways to kind of make their lives easier. Um, you know, we 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 do a lot of work of organizing demographics and technographics. We um, I like to roll up a lot of things and and classify. Uh, you know, things like titles or um, different types of actions that someone is, is taking by intent. So, you know, someone downloading something that's a top of funnel asset versus someone downloading something that's a bottom of the funnel asset, like you can have the seller figure that out. Um, but if you can take that information, automate sort of the first process of like, hey, they downloaded something that actually you, you may care more about than this other thing, um, you know, it makes them more efficient. So again, I, I want them selling, not trying to like read the tea leaves of what's going on in Salesforce. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, forecasting, are you currently responsible for the sales forecast or do you give the tools to sales managers? Oh, the forecast. It's always, that's always like a, a thing that I feel like it's a unspoken thing in the sales ops community. Like you, you always read these articles about people. Oh yeah. Our forecast is we're, we're like within 1%. I'm like, how, how, how are you within 1% of your forecast when you have deal cycles that are six to, you know, who, who knows how long, like these are humans that you're dealing with. Like, there's no way that you are that good. Um, and you kind of talk to these people, you know, and, and, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, forecasting is terrible. Like I, I don't need you know, we, we try. Um, but I mean, one of the things that, that, you know, as a, as a new company that that's difficult about forecasting is just, we don't have a lot of data to lean on. Um, you know, we haven't had thousands of cycles where we know that, you know, this, this thing is a leading indicator of, of good or bad, um, those types of things. So some of the stuff that, that I've built since being here and we finally started to get some of the data around this is, you know, and, and these are very odd things that you would think a CRM would do, but, you know, conversion rates between stages and understanding, you know, what stages are taking longer and starting to optimize those things. Um, and so we've gotten a lot better at forecasting or at least understanding um, and spotting where some of the issues might arise because that's, I mean, we're, we're at the upper echelon of enterprise sales. So, you know, it's, these are, these are big deals. They take a long time. So if we screw something up, um, you know, early on, like we have to be able to, we have to figure out how to spot that early so we can course correct because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's big dollars lost. It's not a high velocity shop where we're losing, you know, a hundred dollar deal because someone screwed up. So um, I think that's, that's kind of where we're at today. I mean, we're always trying to be really good about forecasting and we've gotten a lot better, but um, yeah, that, that, that takes time and continual tweaking. Got it. Um, what do you think is the really valuable or the most valuable KPI you can measure about a rep? Oh, so many. Um, for me, it's, um, you know, a lot of it comes down to effort, I think. Um, you know, you can, you can teach skills, you can, you know, do those types of things. But if you've got, if you've got a rep that just continually is just not putting enough effort in, um, that's, that's, that's always a very leading indicator for me. Um, you know, I don't, we don't today get measured down to the, you know, did you get your 137 emails out today? Um, it's really about like looking at over time, like what are they doing? Um, how are they doing it? And then having those, you know, a lot of this stuff, these KPIs are um, trying to get to a lot of the stuff in CRM is so much as is a lagging indicator. And it's like, oh, well, guess we'll have to try that again later. Um, screwed that one up three months ago. Wish we would have had some sort of leading indicator to know about that. So it's really trying to get to some of those leading indicators of, you know, are, are there meetings dropping off? You know, did they not did they not send enough emails last week or is, is their productivity dipping? So a lot of that is, is productivity um, and, and trying to spot what I call spot the weird um, and, you know, manage by exception. So um, nothing, nothing super fancy really. Okay. Um, and then final question is who in the sales ops world has taught you the most that you know? 
Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm totally self-taught. I mean, other than, you know, being a nerd and asking a lot of questions from a lot of people. So I kind of seek advice from everywhere. Um, one of the, the communities that's, that's always super helpful is the modern sales pro community. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to meet a lot of those folks and, um, it's they, they're everybody's all, always immensely helpful. Um, I, I love talking shop with anyone in, in any kind of ops, sales ops, marketing ops, you know, different industry, high velocity enterprise, you name it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not creative when it comes to art and design. So coming up with creative ways to solve problems and doing those things is, is that that's my creative creativity. And, and I think what's cool about ops for me is that there's, there's not that many like best practices of you, you must do it this way. Um, so if someone comes up with a scalable way to manage something that's cool and, and it works, I, I love seeing how other people have done stuff. So I, I learn things from everybody that I talk to. Um, sales and marketing are so massive that it's, it's impossible for any one person to know everything. So um you know, whether it's just evaluating tools, you know, everybody knows that the sales and marketing tech stack is just silly. Um, so uh, I think I would rather kind of sit down with uh, leaders in cross-functional roles and kind of pick their brain um, than, than just like just sit down with ops people. But uh, yeah, I, I, I love talking to everybody that's kind of in that role because I always end up learning something. Got it. Um, let me pick out the things that I liked. So the, the I'm not going to talk. I, I I sometimes find myself about to like um, say something about salespeople, and I always stop myself. <laughs> and you said that right at the time. What I'm um, I really like the part about um, the, the the two ways you said about helping salespeople, and that being a production cowboy to get stuff out. So they have to wait like a month to get this small thing changed. That was really, yeah. good. and then a really good analogy was about uh, not trying to stop the salespeople from having to read tea bags when a lead comes in. Um, and because the more you can just give them, the less time they have to find out wandering. And then the final one was, yeah, the, the approach to data quality in that it never is going to stop. And actually, if Salesforce did inject bad stuff into sales, <laughs> it into the order, that's probably a good thing because they will keep you yeah. like making it better. So that was awesome. Thank you so much um, for your time. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sales of Demystified podcast. If you are listening on a podcast listening application, then please subscribe, rate, and review. And if you have any questions about the show, if you know a guest, or if you have any questions about sales operations, just hit me up at tomhunt at ebster.com. That's tomhunt at ebster.com.